persona covered in a small goatee that actually uh, decorated the entire area around his erudite mouth. Steve told me in somewhat recent times that my writing concerning my work as a teacher's aide and special education in the San Francisco schools was his favorite of mine. I really enjoyed that. He was apparently visiting England, the birthplace of his grandfather, when the beginnings of what would be a fatal heart attack started troubling him. He died in San Francisco, which I believe is his birthplace. Before the Wednesday night open mic poetry readings at Sacred Grounds Coffee House, the series of talented late uh, poet jo Johanna Wedgwood led for 20 years, the longest running mic in San Francisco or anywhere else now, I believe, in his 21st and 22nd year and run also by talented U San Francisco Unified School District school teacher Dan Brady, Steve, a gifted poet, Stephanie Manning, and I would confer on all things poetic from about 4.30 p.m. until 5, up until the time that all poets lined up behind my chair at the beginning of the open mic list, along with Steve and Stephanie, as well as any other poet who asked me to put him or her in a certain place on the open mic mm. list. Steve volunteered to sign up poets for me at times, I think out of respect for me, to do the front of the list sign up. He or I would then shrink away to another chair and table and take our turns at the mic. Steve had a very strong, clearly enunciated set of poetic pipes. I miss him terribly, and I'm sorry for almost all of the past year, I would imagine, he had seemed to sour on sacred grounds and was not present here. It would have been a better reading had he continued up until the time he was no longer present in what is a strange and distant world in a city that is actually the most wonderful city I know, but can also be a bit strange and distant. Steve Mackin was no doubt a genius, a San Francisco policeman's son who always had to be first reader at the open mic, but who stood back otherwise and not only allowed but encouraged me to be whoever I am artistically, in a real sense, whoever else is here. I wish him a peaceful, and if such a thing exists, an exciting journey to whatever realm he has begun his new life. Yeah. Second half of our feature time here is Mr. Don Brennan. Give him a round. Thank you. Thank you. For a square or a rectangle. I heard about one. I'm going to share the mic with Steve here. I'm going to read two of his poems and two of mine. This one is from, uh, this first one is. Uh, you got to get really close. Oh, first one is a so uh, called a sonnet, and it's from uh, the book that's already been read from this evening, The Thin Line Between the City and the Sea, a sonnet by Steve Mar Mac Mackin. In the decline of days when the body fails is when a soul arrives at white-hot depths. For when one hopes that all life's sordid tales will temper and cool all love's red-hot breaths, is when it seems dry detritus of experience supplies love with the fuels to raise a flame far hotter than youth's too new consequence. Those savage brands all taken in love's name. Yet when I heave my heart into my tongue, the alembic of the past seals passion's plume I have not the strength to break it with the lung. It burns in the accretion of love's past fume. Seems all the hearts and passions of my youth were nothing. In age, love's crucible is truth. And uh, I've. Your family's not dead. I have two poems I'm going to read. One of them is Steve's and one of them is mine from the uh, Sacred Grounds Anthology number 12, published in the winter of 2003. Wow. So I'm going to read mine first. 
and uh, I watched the NBA Finals. I was thrilled to death. But it made me think of this poem that I read a long time ago called Game Days. These must be the sporting days, times of luxury, of spectacular games of grown men dreaming lost child dreams of grandstands and horse cheers, thundering crowds and funny painted faces, grinning into cameras like the teeth of homecoming queens, screaming the names of entertaining heroes on famous feathery afternoons of planes flying fighter formation over stadiums through national anthem skies. Dancing girls and muscle men running in green grass circles sponsored by big tough trucks and gassy drinks. Broadcasting drama into the spaces where we live, thrills of winning, terrors of losing, catharsis setting off our dizzy minds like displays of fireworks, exploding melodrama into dull, disordered lives. These must be the days of play, frivolity and brain froth overflowing the upturned bottles of beer, the game days, the exploding days, our time of patriotic mania and song. These must be the empire's sporting days, playing out its mass destruction games, depleted uranium, weapons of wholesale murder days, the empire's time for starving children, sweatshop, sex slave games. Mm -hmm. Keep half the world trapped in poverty games. These must be the days. Rape the earth for oil and hospitals are collateral damage games. Undermine the Kyoto Agreement, the International Criminal Court, and small arms treaty games. Mm -hmm. There must be the unilateral dump the ABM accord, trash the chemical and biological weapons convention days. These must be the big game days of the Raider Nation. <laughs> I never heard Steve read this one, but I would have liked to. It's called Elvis Dionysius, mm. and it's from uh, 2003. It's by Steve Mackin. Deep within Vegas and Graceland vulgarity burns the pious fervor, pious fervor of rock and roll, garish and exuberant, love of lyric flesh, the throb of the will, the impetus to be. Sad young Elvis was the beautiful boy, suckled on the rich soul milk of Memphis, delirium of a tent song, grace within a sacred psalm, sneering Narcissus drunk on lyric laughter. Sad, fat Elvis was led to the slaughter, wreathed in garlands and Vegas baubles, his scarf stretched, rippling, a blood ribbon trailing from the ecstatic hands of a man. I don't know what man it means, but Steve did. <laughs> You may recognize the theme. Anarchy at the top. 21st century corporations create wealth for the 1%, sustain chaos among the global poor, steal everyone's labor and resources, engineer civil war wherever possible, corrupt all our government, sell any weapon to the highest bidder, convince developed societies to fear terrorism, organize both the drug trade and wars on drugs, push market prices higher and higher for anything known to be unsustainable, including the Earth's atmosphere. 21st century anarchy begins and ends in corporate boardrooms. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute break-ish, so we'll talk to your neighbors, and we'll be back. My, my dearly beloved wife, Wendy, will bring us in after the break. So then we got lots of people coming up. Uh, Justice, Ed, 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 Ed Mike Q, Tom, Gary B, Greg Pond, Garrett Murphy, Vinny, Carl, Amy, and Jack Millender. So we can see, I saw you come in, so I put you on there. So he's our closer, so 10 minutes, and we'll be back in action. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, more commercial messages will follow. <laughs> oh.
Oh, Jimmy. Sorry. It's Jimmy, not Vinny. <laughs> but Vinny's coming. My, my, my cousin. I go back and forth between the North Bay and the South Bay. Your toes and mail and number, but I have yours. I, might, I don't know if I have a sister phone or not. So, you know, after they meet, it's like they're longer to take pictures of them. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 so uh, oh, it's going to so go tonight. I want to see I would appreciate it. I Sometimes, like, before I put it this way, I take a look. Oh, that's what I thought I'd do is I'd give him my email address. I don't know how many friends that he had that are out there. Uh, well, one thing I can do is I can make it sound like an email and the like to participate in other things. But on the back, there's like this thing. You take the contents and so forth. Uh, wasn't he in the military or was he in the NASA or something? Because he used to be a very strong military background before he got into the whole earth community. And then they opened um, they opened a little head shop and they were doing the Oracle down there. So they were selling a lot of the things that were going on. And a lot of stuff from India, a lot of sculptures, rugs, and tapestries. That was the last time I saw it. Yes, I'm hosting every Thursday. It's better behaved. Okay. Tomorrow night's going to be nice. A feature is going to play for 45 minutes. It's pretty exciting. And then the people who come here are pretty nice. I mean, most of the people that come here just think this is the best open mic in town. We treat people differently. Well, you just keep on trucking, and I'm sincere when I tell you that. Just keep on keeping on. That's all we can do. Uh, only on the internet. I see it. You know, we email. Not, not when he comes into town. Sometimes, but he only comes into town about once every two or three years. No, but so I am not going to tell him that you met the guy who bought it. Oh, no. Oh, 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 you bought his house, the one that's on the left? Yes, he's got the flu. Great. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm carrying no charge. The little cup. I will. I'll do that. But she says her last name. I'm not carrying no charge. 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 Yeah, people have some idea of what a hippie is. You're tough. I'm not in it. It's not what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? It's going to be good to hear you read. 
I'm going to argue all the time, you know, even if you're the candidate. Politically you can buy them on. Of course, completely different. I don't. I don't like bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But good on on one of them. I'm not clear on today if there were two decisions or one. One was good for the gay marriage, right? There was Doma and there was Proposition A, and I don't suppose I thought they overturned both of them. Somebody told me they overturned one of them. I'm not sure which one they overturned. That's what I heard. Somebody said you know, they, they, one of them was overturned and the other was the opposite. You know, and, but people in California can get married. You know, it was good for that. And that was Proposition A. Yeah, so maybe Bill was. In the box, you know, and but, you know, I mean, that's the only thing you remember. Well, you know, you know, can you imagine you know, you know, you know, you know, Yes. Is it possible to move this so yes. I can get uh, uh, record yeah. the artist? Yeah, where, where do you want to be? Oh, anywhere so I can point the camera at them and not just record their crotch. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, if you move your computer and then put it right where your computer is, I'll move this back far enough so that. Um, what? Well, that's all right. Just leave it then. Because I'm going to I'm going to sit here and operate my computer, so I'm not going to move it. Oh. Well, I can't uh, how do that. about we move this far enough back? Yeah, that's a, that's that would that'd be fine. I'd appreciate that. There you go. That's it. That's we're, all I we're also going to do a closing number. Well, that's okay. And then I can put it on camera now. Put it here. I can put it here, and then we can see. It's tall enough. We'll be able to see people. Yeah, cool. And then I won't be blocking you. And let's see if we can. 
Yeah. Yeah. See, then I can I can get it in. Um, excellent. Excellent. And, uh, actually, just a little. You want it back a little further? No. Like, look, now I got your whole screen. That'll look good. Yeah. That'll look good. Thanks. And then I can just turn this this way to the mic. And when people are on the mic, uh, I gotta loosen this a little. There you go. Thank you very much. Sure. That sounds right. You got a clear shot? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, okay. I do. Ladies and gentlemen, and if I you can kindly take your seats, we're going to begin our second half tonight. Right at their face. Good. We have uh, several people coming up. If you could kindly have a seat. Well, okay. But I'm still. Beep, 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 beep. I don't know why, but I All right. They went together. Almost here. They seem to snap already. All right. Give my nearly beloved wife a round of applause. She's coming up there, breaking us up after the break. Wendy Walters speaking clearly and heavily in English. Thank you. In English. In the English language. Someday I'll learn. I wrote some thoughts about Steve, and um, if there's time, I'd like to read one or two of his yeah. poems. How much time? Yeah, five ish. Okay. So it's not quite a poem, but I might turn it into a poem. But I'm going to read it. About yeah, Steve. You're, really on point. You're, reading. You're crooked. Get it in there. About Steve. Can you hear me now? Yeah. And I, I, I love the picture of him with the little boy. We're standing there like that. Oh, I love that picture, and it's, it's him. Yeah. If you, if you can get a chance to look at that book. For Steve Mackett. Uh oh. You were a presence. You spoke your mind. Yet full you were of questions. You knew there was something beyond reason and intellect. Something beyond the words of language or the paint on a canvas. Something that was hard to discern. Hard to discern. An impulse, a sense, an intuition that existed in and through the expressions of life, though how confusing meaning could be. You loved fine art and poetry, adored them both, and love and beauty. Sentimental and romantic, excuse me, <laughs> you wrote of memories and dreams and had a deep nostalgia for the old San Francisco and for young love. How closely you observed nature with great enjoyment and sensitivity to nuances. Never before had I heard such a catalog of places in one big city, the city of San Francisco, through which at one time or another you had trekked in all these many, many places. I can only guess how many museums you surely must have visited in your various traverses here and elsewhere, which brought much inspiration for your poems. Sentimental and romantic in spirit, you wanted to break, to break, wait, hold on, sorry. Sentimental and romantic in spirit, you wanted, you wanted to break into and not and not be through life's restriction. You wanted to break into action and not be restricted by life, not be limited to the reaches of your imagination. You wanted to be and do more. Well, Steve P. Mack, in this I tell you, that what you brought was warm and worthy, as you had hoped, and your hearty soul, even if timid in your view, came through mightily. All right. I actually went through and read about half his poems because I hadn't read all of them and you know we had a little collection and I just went through a whole bunch of them and got to know them even more. Um, this one is from The Cave of the First Myth, one of his booklets, and it's called Sensation, it's called Poetry, Sensation from Thought. I listened to a poet tonight whose words touched me, they actually touched me. 
I felt them like fingers, mm. or a soft breath, or a feather of long hair brushing my arm. And I sighed. I heard animal bleating songs and felt the cruelest incisions. I could feel the hot and wet tongue in the ear, at the lip. Oh, the body. Twelve feet away from me, yet the words were plectrums, plucking nerves with precision. Mm. So I tasted honey and cinnamon. I felt the rocky burn my throat. Aslan Sutu, the lion's milk. She read me dizzy on a rock, and I saw the lights go out. She sang words into Ikher, Ikher. She sang words into vapors. She drew the sensation of light upon the skin. Oh, the poetry. Oh, the body. And this, he wrote a poem every day in the month of November in 2010, which I thought was cut. November 22nd, he wrote this. San Francisco Sonnets, one. I grew up on my toes and on my heels as San Francisco was perpendicular. I grew up on a horseshoe block that leaned against the raked face of a Twin Hill Peaks Hill. And I saw from my childhood, bedroom still, homes like pilgrims crawl up Mount Sutro that soared above a cold gray reservoir. And I saw from my childhood bedroom door upon its crest the giant TV tower that spike beetling eucalyptus in a line, bowing and swaying like old women praying. And I thought old Sutro Tower, a giant rude whose constant leaking light posed in a code, you will understand this when you're old. Two, the sea-washed air of San Francisco is amenable to light, even in a winter rain, under dense gray tinted skies. The human lights from cars and shops and lamps on poles along the streets will all shine with a clarity not found except in Italy, or maybe on a thousand Greek isles. I love the light of San Francisco as I love how the fogs slide through the towers of the Golden Gate and pours between the Twin Peaks like the dark and vicious ghosts of oceans. Thank you, Steve, for being with us while you are. Thank you. Wendy Walt is going to request the lights. Thank you. Justice is coming, then, uh, Bob, who said he might, and then we got uh, I've never heard that Mr. Ever. Mike Hugh, then oh, Tom, then me. Gary, then Greg, then Garrett, Ginny, and a few others. So. <laughs> and Vinny. Hello, family. That's my Vinny, my cousin. Continuing with the same book, this is from November 19th, 2010. As I am a Californian, I am an American. But first and foremost, I must declare that I am a San Franciscan, born and branded, without pedigree, a small piece of a soul bent mm. by the Pacific and liquidity of stone. Mm. If you prick me, do I not bleed Pacific fog? And is it not my flesh as tart as sourdough? So it was upon the 100th anniversary of the great 1906 earthquake and fire at 5.12 a.m. I stood with the 12 survivors at Third and Market near Lotus Fountain. Mm. Actually, closest I got was three blocks away. Thousands upon thousands crowded Market and Third and Kearney, and we all grew still at the tolling of a bell as Gavin hung a wreath on a pediment on Lotus Crabtree's Fountain. If you closed your eyes, you could almost hear Tetrasini singing there Christmas Eve. 1910. That's beautiful. A thousand people showed up to I was there that night, but I, I, I was like 20 feet from the stage. It was mm. a privilege. This one's on my birthday, November 28th. It starts with a quote by Eugene O'Neill, A Long Day's Journey into Night Act Four. Like a saint's vision of beatitude, like the veil of things as they seem drawn back by an unseen hand. For a second you see, and seems the secret, 
are the secret. For a second there, it's meaning. Often I have stared at a liquid emotion, at water seeking to reveal its true nature, and thought I saw electricity, then heard reason tell me it was just an illusion, a trick of light upon swift, sluicing surfaces. But I believe that I touched something truer, what lies beneath the skin, known by senses, existence as essence, immaculate, immutable, but the gadfly of reason always calls me back to the corroding narratives of the in intellective, to beginnings and endings, to good and evil, to joy and despair, to pain and pleasure, to belief and doubt, the banal templates we use to shield us from the paralysis of meaning. one of Steve's secrets. He has many secrets. That man left very quietly. You have no idea. We were his family. We are his family. So, when I met him out at the, what's the name of that coffee house again? Simple Pleasures. Simple Pleasures. Usually I'm the one that's late. I was really early that time because I didn't want to miss him. And I pulled books off the walls, off the shelves, and one started with so, with an exclamation point. So, um, believe it or not, with all that erotica and <coughs> Portuguese tradition I've been using, that's one of the things. So, duh, duh, duh. <laughs> so the uh, tradition is called uh, saudade or shadad. Uh, it's a Portuguese tradition that they have in their poetry and music for longing for the missing, longing what you can't have, longing for the missing child, like down south of Central America. So here's one of mine. I brought it back from the dead, <laughs> and hopefully I got it right this time. This one reminds me of Steve, so every once in a while that so shows up. These are my poems. So. I write this poem from our bed, oh, so quiet, recalling the softness of your heart like a gentle rain, the pause of my breath in anticipation for your lips soft and full, the way you looked at me that long, long while and smiled with your brown, burning eyes, your urgent needs seeming more like life and death, how you give sleepless nights new meaning, surprises full of possibilities, your shadow conjuring me, our shadow consuming us. We were infinite, facing storms without armor. You had me at that first fatal kiss, heart soft, like falling rain. I still feel where your mouth has been. Flush with longing in this empty bed, my hands are shaking. How my pen aches, how this poem suffers and not for the lack of wanting. Empty, I have fallen out of belonging. What we read, what Wendy and I read from, is available at the raffle. Yes, that's the door prize, just so you know, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, is Ed still here? No, he left. Okay. Uh, Tom. Gary. Tom Gary. Okay. Thank you so much. Then we have Gary B. It's a different Gary. It's a great Gary B. is coming up. And this is your first time here? No. Not even. Oh, he's oh, been here before. Darn it. Back in the 90s. Uh, well, let me get uh, well, well, that's, 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 that's virgin enough for me. Uh. <laughs> Weeps this place, <clears throat> mourns the willow as it weeps, no water droplets on leaves, cries the land, empty creek, rain has gone out of reach, so far is mountain beyond valley's reach, plentiful nutrients a raven seeks, dry, dry moss on branch a raven speaks, heard through valley where willow weeps. Dawn horizon each day speaks, as do branches with faint creek. 
hollow bone, marrow eaten, insects, animals had a feast. Prince, Popper, maybe middle ground, an artist's depiction, flavors of life experience through books, movies, and other forms of art, with different scenarios and characters depicting lifetime in the world. Is this how some discover or escape, reach for a view of life and learn, in some instances avoid aspects of life? Thoughts and emotions react with what's proposed by the artist. Does the art fulfill a reality taken like a pill, an escape administered, or insight of interpretation from art, whether it's what the artist did or didn't intend? Kiss <laughs> piece in progress. Nature, a band. Cool jazz, that is. The swing beat influences palm trees, side-to-side -side motion, a visual metronome. Rainbow notation off fountain spray. Jetting water is a music stand. Beat pushes sheets spray thin. Swing beat bands, bounces with solar flares. Rotating earth keeps a tempo, weathers a time signature. Season change creates infinite songs, as jazz has vast rhythm and note patterns. A zephyr, form of time measure. Pitch, soft as a child's whisper, accented by leaves falling, a branch plopping on soil. A desert stillness, silent pause, a rest note carried through measure. Waterfall Yosemite creates drum that sustains note. Winter shower, raindrops, staccato on a window, a quick note. Somewhere afar, thunder, a strong accent. Stampede on prairie reaches crescendo. Climax, an end, the name. Gary, then Greg, then Garrett. We can write here a nice round, please. We have Mixie Yoda. Thank you. Uh, the fortune of oil is quickly fading into the past. Basic human needs are the future. I'd like to preface this poem with something we've all heard before. Water, water everywhere, and the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. This poem is called, What I Used to Drink. I remember warm candlelit baths that lasted hours but seemed like forever. Filling the kiddie pool and sitting in a few inches of water. Drinking gallons of iced tea, hearing the sound of a waterfall seeing a waterfall. Lowlands drain dry, rivers become streams, while we thirst for cloudbursts of relief. T-Bone Pickens bought the heart of Texas that holds Fort Worth Dallas hostage. The bushes bought Paraguay. <laughs> Perrier fizzes the Great Lakes away. The oil barons have seen the future and know where to look, pooling assets for their prosperity. Usurping rain that once fell free. Water, water, once all around me, now beyond my reach. A luxury for the rich, while I drown in tears. Wow. Good. This is, I should have seen it coming. Hmm. The places I've been, the things I've seen and didn't see, right there before my eyes. If only I could have left my eyes to see more clearly all that surround me, things I wouldn't understand for a long time, a real long time, a deep time, a lifetime. Hmm. 
and this is called, we all go through self-reflection. This is called The Manly Thoughts of Dr. Seuss. Have I thought myself to become the man I am? Or am I the man I think I am? Or do I think I am a man because I am? Or does the man I am cause me to think the way I can? Do I have to be a man to be who I am? Thank you. Greg Pond, and Garrett, and Jimmy, and Carl, if he's still here, and Amy, and Jack. Can I give the regrets of those people while you're sitting out? Yes. Following people have sent their regrets. Uh, Daniel Webster, Jack Webb, Jack Cross, Jack Shit, Jackie Robinson, Robinson Crusoe. Cruella de Vil, Cecil, Bil Cecil B. DeMille, Beating and Cecil, Bugs and Bess, Porgy and Bess, Honeycutt and Pierce, Satchel Page, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, Huntley and Brinkley, Stanley and Livingston, all send their regrets. I've had Satchel Page. Yeah, Satchel and Page. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Greg. Um, I'm just going to do three poems. Um, First one is called Tell Time. How do I tell time without clock to watch or sun to dial? And what do I tell it after it strikes the last chime? There's more than enough to think about, but not enough to blink without the sand getting in your eyes. The hourglass is set on digital display counting the seconds as they slip and sway. How do I measure the minutes of my days when the hands of time keep tick, tick, ticking away? <laughs> Phoenix. I am Phoenix rising higher from smoke and smoldering ashes, soul survivor, with flames lapping at my heels. If this, if I keep ascending, this fire will never catch up unless I stop to breathe. So I continue to climb a ladder towards the sun with wings held by string, not wax, so I won't melt like Icarus with my arms in futile flap while my feathers float to sea. I will soar above the moon and then hitch a ride on heaven's breeze. Catch a current to carry me home if I happen to tire so I can rest my soul. As the smoke rises higher, I am Phoenix, soul survivor. I had the uh, pleasure of reading this poem in a feature I did here, I guess, a couple of years ago. And it's uh, one of Steve's poems. And I chose Spanish guitar because I just loved hearing him read it. And I hope I can just do it justice. Okay. Spanish guitar. I could fall in love with you if you were a Spanish guitar. A Spanish guitar, it is water and tangerine, but you are green. A Spanish guitar is warm on the ear, spun from rubies and boorish hair. Not pomegranates leaving stains and weeping like a violin and taking away the tambourines, shaking like a poison cur. But become a Spanish guitar? I'll dance brightly with orange hands, tapping sprightly on viscera dreams of Catalan and the Alhambra. I would become a Spanish guitar, and lamentation I would tell, to pour a bull into a dove and turn the fiery blood to tears. But I am made of bone and skins, and the roars of great white Birds, let me fall in love with you. Become the thing you know you are. 
I will be to you as a moor, and we will sing my Spanish guitar. Great! Really? <laughs> Garrett Murphy, then uh, Jimmy, then Carl will be still here, Amy, Jack, and Robinson Crusoe. And Steve. And Steve. And, Robinson and Steve, Steve, thank you. Keep me on my toes. Bye-bye. Next round, please. Next round, please. One piece tonight, and it's a chapter for my novel, and um, and it and it also focuses on uh, main characters bidding farewell to an associate. Although it's a little, it's um, it was a more contentious relationship than the one anyone had with Steve Mackin. But, but, but since I got wound up in a, some couple things that prevented me from looking for my some of my own Mac and books, so this will have to do, I'm afraid. Chapter 36. Up, 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 she pulled and pushed herself, fantasizing herself as a sleek panther, albeit a maturing one, making her way to a perch from which she could observe and perform some act for a fallen warrior, almost as one would do for a most honorable enemy. Am I getting a bit long up there for this, she wondered to herself, taking note of her own breathing from her against the cool, sturdy bark of the trunk and branches. Maybe, or maybe not. It's all their fault for my being up here in a sense, that bitching and moaning about how unladylike it was to do this thing. Now I'm the one walking case of arrested development, just as the shiki grab was. One walking case of arrested development. You talk too much, Florence, she continued, both in word and ascension. That's all over now, and nobody can tell you what to do, not to do, or how to do. Keep moving on what women do. Your true self, Miss Dragon Hill. And she did just that. But could that mean that the shaky drab has moved on down? She could not help inquiring. She finally reached the summit of her intention this night, a point in the middle of the tree where two of the branches made a fork, a non pineapple upside down fork, she dubbed it with amusement, and where she could brace herself, hands and feet on the branches, and look down on the ground below. And then she let the tears flow. They flowed, dropping from her eyes and face, and dripping down to whatever lay below. She fantasized that her eyes were the open floodgates, releasing a stream of tears to flow down her face, then waterfall to the grounds below to form a small lake of water in which somehow life could rejuvenate once again. Of course, this wasn't all symbolic as far as the fallen warrior that she gave draft was concerned. In her scenario, the sea her tears was creating was that onto a boat which could be sailed, and into the middle of which the shaky draft ashes could be scattered, as the now freed spirit, restored to its true age, could fly back to the motherland and to its own identity. She could not claim the body or contact any survivors, assuming that there had been any, but could have still vast knowledge of laws and stuff to maneuver things so he could at least find a bit of the security he had apparently never found while alive, which is what she had had done. However repugnant she had believed he was, nobody deserved his fate. At last there were no more tears to shed, and the seed shrank down to the grass terrain of the backyard, posting a tree under which she was wrapped around, observant of all. Have a safe trip home, the shaky drive, she said wearily. She remained in a perch for a long period before finally descending. Now we have Jimmy, then Carl is here, Amy, Jack, Tell and Lauren McCall. Mm -hmm. You're what? in the book. You got two poems in this book. Oh, yeah, I got two poems in the book. Anthology of Occupy. Yes. Uh, yeah. By, yeah, by Jack Hirschman and company. Uh, it's okay. I don't, I don't need to tell him. I'd rather talk about Stephen also that he's like <clears throat> one of those guys, kind of like a keystone in a foundation or that rock in the center of an arch yeah. that you think that is always going to be there. So when he's gone, it's like, how did that happen? And I have a poem that I wrote for my mother, kind of, and my dad. I think it's appropriate for him. I haven't read it ever. 
It's for the best of my life. I won't write anything anymore that does not make me cry. I've laughed enough in my day. When I cry, I know I'm being pure and uncynical. I know the pragmatic beauty in feeling pain and sorrow. Pain guides me to repair my broken body. Sorrow grieves a loss of kindnesses. Somewhere to me, once warmly received, or to a part of Gaia we scarcely knew. Sorrow is the darkness behind the light of joy. These days are love. These days are blue. This is when we feel deeply. What's wrong with that? This is where the march of life has taken us. This is when we know we know. This is where know-how pitches in for sure. This is when love surrounds us in its purest form. This is where each word and hug and how you feeling really means it. This is phew. The next hill looms. And that last one, hooey. This is truly now. I like to think with substance all stored up for our use. I like to think with the track records we have set and prior displays of courage to remind us how strong and competent we are, how good we could do. Today is the first day for the best of my life. I'm working free of me. This is kind of a part two. If I feel pain when I have no pain, when I am content in my own lot, then I know it is empathy. The tears show me where I have to go to be true, to help the dying people, creatures, places, things we need and love. I would kill for a tree. I would die for a healthy salmon run. I would strap on the suicide's vest to save a mountaintop the blue ridges of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia and the black loam of Illinois. But then I would not be around to save another, not to feel the calm joy of life revitalizing, the slaughters spared, nature left pristine, unscathed, unraped. So I cry my work in stark naked tears on beige sheets of hemp. I bake the good strong thoughts into my brain so I can say them over and over and over again, even as tears run down my face. And to anyone who sees, I am unashamed. I would die for what I say. I will certainly cry for it. Today is the first day of the best of my life. I'm working free of me. Part three. If we can be shut up for a minute and we can hear God rustling about in our culture, darting between all of the dreams and strivings, we can hear her pasting it all together like lust for our lives, like love for our families, a certain queer and abusive zeal for our lands, our rivers, our waters, our mountains, our grottos. There is a reverence deep in here while God speaks silencia, loves with its muffles and whooshing translations. Life hears, though, the mouse twitching its ears, such a large proportion of its head. The mule deer, likewise. The owl screeching out of the silence to paralyze its prey with fear. The nearby sounding amid the quiet hearing of the whale, high-pitched calling of dolphins, snakes, hearing with their bellies the trembling of our tread. The puma's head cocked to hear a twig rustle under some delicate hoof or paw. All life is immersed in air and water molecules, swarming, wiggling, ebbing, flowing, roiling by. It's a rare occurrence, silencia, on our planet. It's possible there's no other air or water anywhere in the universe, nothing to carry our precious sounds. No sound, no ohm. No sound is possible in space. Hence, no one out there has ears to hear. In all the universe, perhaps, not one sound. Hence, no story, no news, no music, no bongos, no grinding of gears, no wind in the trees, no touch, no smell, no breath of air, no cool, cool water, only lights and darknesses. Who knows? It's a be here now kind of thing. Imagine, as we chatter away on our speck of sand in the cosmic beach, as we blabber and shout and mutter and gasp, 
warble and vibe and whistle our stories to fill the void here where someone can hear us. Out there in infinity, God is existing, creating and speaking in silence. So before you utter a noise, you really better have something to say. Go ahead, pray all you want. It's only something for you to say. In fact, it's the least you can do out there, Steve. Carry on, make a noise. Yeah. Thank you. Come on up, my dear. Yeah, we can just get those here. This is her first time here. That's more like it. This is my first time here. And yeah, beginners ready. get the clap. Oh, uh, oh, oh, change that oh, sensor oh. just a bit. <laughs> And I haven't read my poems in a long time, but um, it seems like tonight is a special night, so I'm honored to be here. Um, and it's a special night for me, but for different reasons. Um, I'm going to read maybe two. This is the first one. Last footsteps down the hallway of Dream House. We always said we would roller skate down, but a bicycle or two made a loop. We made some things happen. I can feel a thousand breaths as I close the windows for the last time. Never again to breathe our air, never again to be our home. And I find love notes scribbled on post-its under the bed when I move it. And every time I throw something like that away, a little piece of me breaks away because of the loss. And I get through the day driving, lifting, moving, cleaning, repeating, thoughts drifting in nature and meaning, and it all seems too much. Last footsteps I took down the hall, which I took, said my goodbye to the home that held us. And then, when I'm almost done moving, on the curb, when I'm about to load the last boxes, the last memories, the last laughs, the last half smiles, the last hum, clumsy silences, and the last half conversations. There you are, in your wool sweater and your scrub pants, just stopping by after dinner at a friend's. And I've been cleaning for hours. And maybe I set it up for you like that, because I may have a tendency to. But nonetheless, I feel alone and exhausted. And I invite you in to see if you think our broken apartment looks good. And the silence weighs a hundred heavy sighs, and the words weigh a hundred, and the words weigh like heavy pebbles, as we try to say, to just say something. And change is here to break away and break and fray our ways and stray from what we've known, because now we find it alone. And I'm scared to my bones and lonely to my toes, last footsteps down the hall together this time. I feel like somehow I did this, maybe because it's phrased that way when we talk. But if this illusion is multifaceted, and in this case, long acting with two participants, and sad doesn't even begin to cover it, because I can wear a shirt, pants, sweater, shoes, and still feel naked without you. But I untie my shoes and brush my teeth and breathe real deep because now I'm in my new apartment, which came to me really through unbelievable luck. Yet I have every window open and I feel stuck. So I'll just let that sit and tuck myself into my own bed alone and bit by bit let the morning light creep in. And I am going to read this 
funny because it seems like San Francisco is a special place and this is in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I was a little lonely grooming my house plants and out in thin air you, wanted me, you asked me if I want to get a beer and I stop arranging the lavender and sip because this already means something to me. I've been a little lonely and didn't think you would want to drink beers with me. I want to be funny and not too clumsy and not seem too green at this whole casual hanging out thing. Put on a dress, take it off, and put on jeans because I don't want you to know this already means something to me. I scan the bar quickly, nervously, and I don't see you. So I sit by the door in the first corner so when you scan for me, our eyes will meet. And the TV plays basketball in front of me and hockey to the side of me and dudes in jerseys explain enthusiastically. I order an IPA and daydream. Someone, not you, sits in this seat next to me. He orders an IPA and watches one of the TVs, leans over to me and says, you don't look like you're here for the hockey. <laughs> and I chuckle nervously and agree, admit I've been daydreaming. His name is Jeremiah, endearing, sweet, funny, feels at home at the sea. So he joined the Coast Guard 10 years ago and tells me about the irony that he always works on land. And we chat and we laugh and the minutes pass easily. So much so that I almost forget you wanted to meet me and that already means something to me. So I check my phone and you messaged me, I'm in the back. So I scan the bar less quickly, but still nervously, and our eyes meet. You've been here for an hour. You're reading GQ that you took from work, and we laugh about how inappropriate it is for the teens. But the strangely comforting thing is that they don't read it. But you're reading it in the back of the bar, learning just how to be more mysterious, out of reach. You can put the magazine away. You already are those things. At least enough for me, casually. And words flow out of me because conversation streams. And although I've known you for more than a year, tonight I feel like we get to meet. But I think it might mean more to me. You ask me if my new roommate is pretty or a little crazy. If so, you say you'd probably like to sleep with her. You might like her, but I might want you to like me. And you tell me about Kentucky and your family and your little brother who is getting married. And you say you're bad at the dating scene. And you're surprising me because I expected arrogance and you're actually quite sweet. And it's still about 70 degrees with a late night breeze and we walk across the street to get something to eat. Twinkle lights strung between food trucks in the park beneath the trees. In the center, there's a stage, a guy on drums, a guy on bass, a guy with a guitar, and a girl with a tambourine. Mm. Charming scene, so we each have a seat and listen. And I feel a little clumsy in my being here with you, absorbing a new possibility. The girl with the tambourine shakes her hips, moves her feet, opens her lips, and the sounds move me to not speak but rest my feet a little closer to yours and listen. We should probably eat, you say. And I'm a bit shaken like the tambourine lost in the melodies because this night already means something to me. And you're probably not swept off your feet and just hungry. And even though I'm the only thing shaken, I can still hear the tambourine. Uh, the prize of Steve Mackin as a closer. Give him a nice round of applause, please. Uh, what is my poetry? The scribblings of the dabbler, the vanity of the mediocre, the droppling for the dilettante mindfuck techno. To see me in my reductivist mindfuck techno task day job, for if I can't do my thing, I'll be damned if I'll do much of theirs. You'd fit me just another functionary, biddable, nebbish, truckling toady. You wouldn't realize that on my own I have turned myself 
into an instructor of three people in an art sublime could transform any young romantic into a poet for a fee. Except a rap sheet modest as my own effectively cancels my credential. All I can do is make poems myself. The Seeing Unseen, this is one of the series of poems to be screamed while being dragged away. <laughs> the Seeing Unseen. Weep, weep for the thorns, weep for the blindness, weep for the evil has taken our privacy, our dignity away, our rights. Years proliferating the eyes long perched on street lamps at every city <clears throat> intersection where young lovers walking pause canoodling. The omnipresent eye of any badged peeping Tom armed gun soul on the swing shift, feet on the monitor room desk rubbing his crotch somewhere, stares at our baby swoon. Now this eye of power, the eye of monopoly capital, has stolen the net of the net, has stolen off the net the heart locked diary of all our wage slave lives. Hmm. <laughs> Can I get in there? Uh, I need a little time there. Uh, yeah. Okay. The, Can I get in uh, there? Oh, yeah. I didn't know you were going to. I didn't either. Oh, okay. What the hell? Inspiration. <laughs> Mr. Natural. Oh! Yeah. 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 Gee, well, now that you mention it, you do look like yourself. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever said that to you. So, uh, first of all, what I'm doing, I'm streaming live over the internet on a, on a thing called Ustream. I have bought a Ustream channel for Sacred Grounds. And what we're going to do in the next few months when I get a little money, we're going to have a camera permanently installed up here by the light no, sure. with a remote control, which I'll give to Dan. And all he has to do is push That's a button, and you go out on the air all over the world. Okay? Whoa. And then he pushes a button, and it will record. If you do not want to be recorded, he'll push the button. It'll stop the recording, but it'll keep the stream going. We want to be recorded. The idea is, some artists don't. Trust me, I was here Saturday. Half of them didn't want to be recorded. Don't understand why you want to do your poetry in public and don't want people to notice you. Yes. But the idea is, this goes out literally all over the world. Now let me give you an example of how we use it on Thursday night. We had a kid come up here, Francesco, who started playing, who was from Argentina. While I was online, I noticed that his mother came online from Argentina at 2.30 in the morning, and she was watching him live. The next thing I know, his dad comes in, but his dad was in New York. His dad called an aunt who was in Alberta, Canada. She called her husband, who was in Scotland. And all of them watched his performance live. That's what this is doing for you. It's allowing you to promote yourself literally all over the world. And if you have friends that are shut in or can't come here or you can't get a bus or something's going wrong, you pull out your iPhone or your little iPad or your little computer and you dial into the sacred grounds and you're right there with us live. That's what will be happening in the near future. So now a little poetry. Troubadour sings sweet melodies of love, sewing as a needle and thread all the souls that hear his silvery tones. Joining the head to the heart through the tongue and ear shows what fine hand this craftsman owns. Well spun, my friend. Well done. And, um, I came from Chicago in 1966 and have been here ever since. And on my 21st birthday in Chicago, I was on the football field with some friends throwing a football around. It was a day like today, beautiful. And out of absolutely nowhere, a bolt of lightning came out of the ground, out of the sky, and hit my friend John, knocked him down, and killed him instantly in front of me. I couldn't react. I was so hysterical, that I had absolutely no feelings. And for two years, I walked around in a complete daze, unable to feel anything. And then on my 23rd birthday, I read this poem, came to me, and um, I haven't stopped crying since. This is for Steve. 
meditations on my friend's death. Weep not when I am gone, for they that weep the most loved me the least. Cry on when I am gone, cry not when I am gone, for he, he knows that God can hear the tears in my heart. I cry no tears for my dear friend when he leaves me, for my heart screams of his loss. I show no emotions when my friend leaves me, for my mind accepts this loss. I feel the pain of grief when my friend leaves me, for God comforts my soul. So weep no tears when I am gone, for those who loved me most will always find me deep in their hearts. Just one more here. This is called existentialism. Very difficult to write a poem about nothing. <laughs> Gold fires exploding in my mind, in my, in my head, lighting the dark labyrinths of my mind. Light cycles moving through the shadowed pages of my two-dimensional consciousness, and then a child kicks the walls of an infinite universe, and Buddha smiles, and in silence, Man whispers into the darkness, I am. And so God closes his eyes to sleep, perhaps forever. And now I'm going to try to do the impossible. I'm going to try to give you all the feeling of existentialism. And it's really quite simple. It's basically a knock-knock joke. And no, you all no. started. Are you ready? You all started with. No. 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 Who's there? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's hope the technology works. The battery's gone on the PC, uh, so we can't we can't display it through the large screen. But you oh. can see Steve through the small screen and I've hooked up the audio so hopefully we'll also be able to hear Steve who did a poem called When I Am Dead. And I'll close with this. I wrote this today. When I am dead. And when I am dead let their dirges be sung to the turban-mad twirl of the dervish and hun on the fields of the twilight as the moon loves the sun. <clears throat> and when I am dead, I will leave not a mark except for these poems that I carve on the heart of the pale of night as Venus fucks Mars. <laughs> and when I am dead, why then build me a pile of my books and my poems consign me to fire. Oh, play me rude cantos of the ruin of desire. Mm. I, I interpreted his words a little uh, differently. I burned a DVD. <laughs> All right. Oh. So for those of you familiar with the closing ceremonies of a given uh, evening at Sacred Grounds, uh, if you sign in as a poet, then your name is on this list, and on this list are numbers, and on these cards are numbers, which I'm shuffling before your very eyes right now. And I will hand to an innocent bystander or do something innocent? <laughs> well, you call I pay it, but you, you got the wrong man. <laughs> and then a drum roll. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, just to let you know, you have any one of these fine prizes Steve Mackin and Steve Mackin. Uh, poetry Magazine. I can't remember how to say that. Whatever it is. And so the purse into a. Salazier. Salazier. And of course, one of the smallest magazines ever. So uh, the, the, we have as a winner Amy. 
Mm. You are a wiener. Oh, wow. Take one of these fine prizes or make it any wiener. Any of these fine prizes or Congratulations, oh, first time here. Well, you have either one of these to choose from. This, this, some of the palms in here were read tonight. A a Amy, could, Amy, could you get me a lottery ticket right now? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The <laughs> Chris Trian. Oh, oh Riddle Wall. Oh, I, I never win anything. He always says that every time he wins. I can't believe that. Thank you. Let's see. I'll take a Can I take a second? Yes, you can take a second. You know what? I just had an idea. Some of you people are much more technical than I am, or, you know, photographic and stuff like that. City Lights Bookstore and other venues I've seen has pictures. I remember when I was a kid of all the poets that were right. dead all over the wall. Wouldn't it be cool if any of you had like photos of some of the people who have passed and we put them on the wall? Yeah. You know, and a special section would be really cool. Like that? Yeah, yeah, like that. Any kind of picture. And we could see them and not just forget them. Oh, that was a wonderful memorial. They're gone. It would be kind of cool, you know? Think about it. Think about it. Drum roll! Oh, Temple! Any one of these fine prizes are yours. These prizes come from the minds of your people like you. No, okay. I've got this one. So ear. All right, thank you so much. And we have three more fabulous prizes. Gary B. Hey, hey. Gary B. Yeah. Yeah. Prizes are a mini feature, whichever you desire. Prizes are what? What is that email like about? I don't, uh, or you can decide if you want to do next week's mini feature, which is an eight minutes oh, long. Oh, the new ones don't know about that. I've been saying it all He's a, uh -huh. not a new, he's a regurgitated old one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, he takes a look. Yeah. All right, here we go. And Lucky 13. That's your lucky 13. Don't call it Are you going to be around next week? No, I'm not going home tomorrow. Oh, you're going home tomorrow. Well, then you can't. Either one of these is fine. Oh, good. Good job. Thank you. And last one. Safe journey. Actually, not the last one. Garrett Murphy. You have to talk to Oh. Raffles about this, mini features. Cool. Okay, so now this 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 person has a chance to be the mini feature because no one else is taking that. Try so. Cesar. Don. Clara. Yeah, yeah. Would you like a mini feature? Yes. Just a check. <laughs> <laughs> Music it's business is a ruthless uh, business. <laughs> yes, it is July. It would be fourth. It the fourth of July. No, no, it's the third. It would be the third. You, yes? Okay, so July give a round of applause for our people. All right. Great. Stepping into the breach, as they say. And I want to thank you for coming here tonight. I, I'm hoping that Steve's family enjoyed themselves and had some kind of reflection of what we, we feel about it. Glad yeah. to see you can both I, here. They, can I make they, an announcement? Yes, an announcement, and then we are. Oh, yes. Can I say something quickly, just very fast? I have, I've told stories, and there's an African story that talks about a man who died, and 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 what, and the whole thing comes up with with the boy who who did the most to bring back to life was the young son who said, where is my father? Because it is told in Africa that you are not dead as long as you are remembered. That's right. And yeah. I just think that's appropriate. That's right. And now I'm announcing and then we will close for the evening.